Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our third transatlantic lecture on insurance law. I do so also on behalf of my co-organizers, Christoph Prömmelmeier, Jeffrey Stempel, Eric Knudsen, and Oliver William. And of course, in the name of the Insurance Law Special Interest Group within the European Law Institute. The two lectures scheduled for fall 2021 deal with the overarching topic, artificial intelligence and insurance-based compensation schemes. We observe the deep concern of practitioners and policymakers about the proper regulation of liability for the use of artificial intelligence. We believe that whenever liability is the issue, insurance provides for the solution, or in other terms, rules on liability are never enacted without a proper appreciation of the insurance context. Therefore, while we will have a look at recent developments in liability law, we will shift the focus towards insurance law. Thus, today's lecture will, be, will deal with liability and insurance concerning artificial intelligence, recent trends in US and EU law. We are very glad and extremely grateful that leading experts in the field followed our invitation as speakers. It is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Mr. Dirk Staudenmeier. Mr. Staudenmeier is head of unit at the European Commission and acts as a honorary professor at the University of Münster in Germany. He agreed that I will not mention further points of his rich and outstanding vita for the sake of time. This is why I would like to immediately give the floor to you, Professor Staudenmeier, for your lecture on liability for artificial intelligence and insurance, reflections at EU level. And I would also like to thank you again for being with us today. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or good evening where I sit here. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I thank very much the organizers for inviting me to this uh, very stimulating and, and interesting approach at looking at AI liability. Uh, I would like, as I have been given around 20 minutes, basically to speak in two parts. First of all, I would like to speak about AI, AI and liability, and here a little bit, say a little bit about the objectives of what the Commission is working on, because that is important for the role of the insurance. The challenges of AI to liability rules, because that is important, how you can ensure the risks of liability, and some substantive elements where our thinking goes. And then I would like to turn to the questions of redress and insurance um, before to conclude. And I hope to be able to stick to the time granted to me by the organizers. So AI and liability. The commission has started with uh, a white paper on AI and an accompanying commission report on AI liability. Now, I do not want to uh, uh, mention all those points, in this white paper, which launched a very broad public consultation and led already the Commission to suggest several uh, legislative initiatives this year, early this year, in the area of uh, product safety and ethical concerns. But what is important in the white paper and which sort of is the, the guiding star to our work are certain political objectives and they are very relevant, as we can see when we later speak about the role of insurance. So first of all, the, one of the very high objectives basically in this work is to promote the rollout of this new enabling technology. Because the EU would like to uh, harvest the advantages AI as an enabling technology has for our economy, and for our society. So that's a primary objective. Now, then obviously this becomes a little bit more concrete in terms of objectives. And here we're looking uh, basically at 
businesses and we are looking at possible victims. And uh, for the businesses, we would like to uh, make sure that they find a situation where they have sufficient legal certainty to go into another country in the internal market and disseminate their products equipped with AI and their services equipped with AI. Now, in order to do that, it makes sense to know the liability risks you're facing because then you can insure yourself against them. So there is a, as a very clear interest from a business side to have legal certainty and to reduce fragmentation. That's the business side. For the victim side, of course, um, victims face a problem. And I come to that in a minute when I speak about the challenges of AI to liability. Um, but they uh, are in a situation where they could be the victim of a damage caused by a technology equipped with AI. And what we don't want to have is a situation where a victim of a damage caused by AI has no compensation or less compensation than a victim uh, in a damage caused by a traditional technology in a comparable case. Because that would achieve two things. It would, first of all, shatter the trust in the EU justice system. And second, and possibly in also in this context of or in the objective of promoting the rollout of AI, also it would shatter the trust in the technology. And that would hamper the rollout of the technology and the uptake of the technology. And that's what we do not want to have. Uh, I can imagine, uh, mention in this context that for the impact assessment, which we at the moment doing, and I say a bit at the end what the, our next deliverables are, uh, for the impact assessment we're doing, we have done a behavioral economic study and the results are fairly clear. So it's very obvious that a, a victim-friendly liability regime would preserve or promote the trust in the technology. On the contrary, a liability regime which is not equipped and not adapted to the challenges of AI would diminish not to say destroy the trust in the technology and that again according to this behavioral economic study would have an impact on the uptake of the technology so these are the objectives and from that uh, the, the most operational objective is deducting and that is to find a liability regime which is which works which is adapted to the challenges of ai and it puts the victim in a position where it doesn't have, it has a comparable level of protection compared to damages caused by traditional technologies. No more, but not less either. So this is as to the uh, objectives. Now, as to the um, challenges of AI, I don't want to go into details because this is not the place here, but I, let me just mention two, two keywords, opacity, and autonomy. Um, let me take the example of a car because I will come back to that. And, and autonomous vehicles are uh, the probably one of the product categories which will be first rolled out on the market. And it's sort of when people speak about AI, they often mention autonomous vehicles. So I'll just take that example. Yeah. So basically, you can test an autonomous vehicle how it reacts in a specific traffic situation. And if the autonomous vehicle is in exactly the same traffic situation, it will react in exactly the same way. However, with autonomous AI, so we're not speaking about all AI systems. Yeah? We're speaking about autonomous AI systems. That means in the, in the true sense of the meaning, you know, from Greek, autos means itself and nomos is, is rule or, or, or law. So these are the systems which give themselves their rules, mainly machine learning, and apply them. And then come to a certain result, which is not foreseeable by the human design. So basically, in my example, yes, in exactly the same situation, it is foreseeable and clear 
that the autonomous vehicle will react in exactly the same way. But there is no such thing as exactly the same situation. There will be different uh, parameters, different light, different speed of the participants, different street conditions, whatever. And then one cannot know what the, how the AI will react. And one can net not know this in advance. And the second point which I wanted to mention is opacity. AI basically has an input in form of data and an output. And that output may lead to a damage. Now, it can be described how an input leads to an output. But what is very difficult, if not impossible to describe for more uh, complex forms of AI is how exactly in that specific situation that input led to that output. And now these two things, the autonomy and the opacity taken together, put the victim in a very difficult situation. Because the victim, for all at least fault-based liability systems, which all member states of the EU have, has to prove a fault, a damage, and causality between the fault and the damage. And it will be very, very difficult because of opacity and autonomy, first of all, to identify the liable uh, person, and then to prove what exactly happened that um, which led, what is the fault, or where, why did that lead, that action or omission lead to that damage. And that's the problem. And that shows that our liability rules are not adapted to the challenges of AI. And that's the challenges policymakers and lawmakers one has. Now, in order to um, deal with such challenges, the Commission is reflecting about a number of substantive elements. And they have been already been described and put for a, forward to a consultation in this uh, commission report accompanying the white paper. We had very interesting consultation, but now we will launch another one. I'll say a few words about that at the end, uh, which will be very dedicated to this. So basically what we are thinking about is, first of all, we have to look at this from a holistic, uh, uh, at this challenge from a holistic point of view. And we have three pillars of liability law in the EU. We have fault-based liability, all member states have this. We have pro a product liability based on the product liability directive, all member states have this. And we have strict liability. Now that last pillar is different in the member states. I mean, don't criticize me on the details, but broadly speaking, there are um, several groups of member states. Yeah? There is the group of member states in terms of strict liability, which says every object or action leads to strict liability. Some member states do that, for instance, France or Romania. And there are other member states who say if there's a dangerous activity or a dangerous product, that leads to strict liability. And then there's a third group of member states which say there are certain technologies like cars, trains, planes, possibly drones, which increase a high risk or have a high risk for the public at large, and therefore there is strict liability. But in all those cases, there is one underlying common reasoning, and that is one sees a certain risk to which the public at large is exposed, and somebody, mostly the operator, draws a benefit out of exposing the public at large to that risk. If that risk materializes, the legislator decides that operator should be liable without the victim having to prove fault and causality. So basically, here we have already quite a difference between member states. And we have therefore also some, not only fragmentation, but also legal certainty, because for instance, is AI a dangerous activity? That will be difficult to justify because the purpose of AI is to make it safer. And in my car example, I mean, we are, we are allowing ourselves to eradicate each year a small town um, 
through traffic accidents. And the, the two biggest cases of traffic accidents are speed driving and drunk driving. And that won't happen if they are. So basically, AI is supposed to be safer. Is it therefore a dangerous activity, which is supposed to be subject to strict liability? An open question, one of many. So basically, we want to look at this holistically, at all three pillars of liability law. And so therefore we are looking at fault-based liability, product liability, and um, strict liability. Now, one could deal with this differently because obviously product liability is partially concerned, but the product liability directive goes much beyond AI uh, because it concerns all kinds of products and not only those equipped with AI. Um, so basically here again, there is a question of, of a matrix and, and, and of dimensions, which we have to see how, how we deal with this. But clearly looking at all three um, uh, pillars and let me, say a few thoughts of what we have for fault-based and strict liability. And I focus on strict liability because there the insurance aspect is more interesting, but it's also interesting for fault-based liability. For fault-based liability, we are, and that will concern probably the large mass of AI systems, we're thinking about facilitating the burden of proof because the burden of proof is really the problem for the victim. Now, how this is done is not yet decided. Whether this is done is not yet decided. But that's the idea. And for strict liability, one for first would need to decide whether one should have strict liability at all. Um, the expert group, which was um, preparing uh, the commission report accompanying the white paper, had suggested uh, strict liability to introduce strict liability for certain categories of cases. And basically, where there is an important legal interest of a high value at stake. So that's life, health, property, and the public at large is exposed to risk. And then it should be the operator who is liable for this. One could do that. If one does that, the question of insurance rises. And so therefore now I'm going to the the, my second part, which is the question of insurance and redress. So first of all, the question of insurance arises in both, in fault-based liability and in strict, because in both scenarios, the potentially liable person has an interest to insure himself. Uh, why? Uh, because simply then um, the uh, the, the, the burden of the cost is reduced to the annual insurance premium. And the victim also has an interest that the potentially liable person is insured <coughs> because um, the, um, the um, victim then can turn against the insurance industry or the insurer of the liable person and will have a relatively smooth compensation. And that's obviously an advantage for the victim. So basically, there are already some advantages. And the question is, therefore, should one introduce an insurance obligation? We're not thinking about insurance obligation in terms of fault-based liability. That's definitely, definitely voluntary insurance, or at least in our thinking, one never knows. But basically, that is voluntary insurance. And that's what was said in the, or can be deducted also from the commission report accompanying the white paper. But we, but we are thinking about mandatory insurance for the strict liability cases, because simply looking at member states law and all these different categories of cases where strict liability exists, it is almost always coupled with, with mandatory insurance because of the high risk and because of the the, the amount of damage at stake. And so therefore one can even can think about um, mandatory insurance in case of strict liability. Now, let me turn to my, uh, go back to my car example and le let's come to the function of insurance and of redress. Let's take a simple case. Um, so uh, a, a, a person walking along the street is hurt by an autonomous vehicle. Now, in almost all European countries, this person has at least three claims, and some it has four. Uh, so basically, it has a claim based on fault-based liability against the driver. It has, but there is no driver in our case. 
It has a claim against the producer if there was a defect and it has a claim against the owner of the car because almost all countries in the EU have a strict liability of the car owner. Now, in reality, the, the victims almost always proceed on the basis of a strict liability because it's the easiest, the least to prove. So there's a claim against the operator, or in this case, the holder of the car uh, for, for damages. As there is, and that's even for cars, even fully harmonized for the motor insurance directed uh, mandatory insurance obligation, the insurance compensates the victim. Now, it doesn't have to be that the buck stops there, because basically it may be, for instance, that the defect is due to a defect done by the producer, software defective, for instance, defective design of the AI. Now then, um, the, the victim is already compensated, the victim is fine, that is taken care of. But then the producer, or in this case, the insurance who compensated the victim should be able to go, the insurance of the operator should be able to go against the producer who may be the liable person according to the product liability directive. Now that producer is not obliged, but in practice, um, we have seen this when we evaluated the application of the product liability directive in 80% in of the cases have professional liability insurance. So that means that the um, insurance of the operator will turn against the producer and say, I have compensated the victim, please pay me back. And that will be covered by the insurance of the producer. Now, it may be that now the producer may have a claim against the software developer from whom he got the AI in order to keep it short and not make the, uh, the, the value chain too long. And then there has a claim against, um, let's say, on contract against the software developer. And then turns to the software developer and says, look, I producer or my insurance had to compensate the insurance of the operator to pay the victim. Now you pay because it was your fault. Again, the software developers in almost all cases will have insurance. And therefore at the end, it will be the software developer which pays the cost and its insurance. Now, why am I bringing all this chain? Because it's obviously fairly obvious to you because we will achieve two objectives and they are very important and they link back to my policy objectives at the very beginning of my um, intervention. So basically we achieve two uh, objectives. The first one is all the economic operators in the game, in my example, the software developer, the producer and the operator can limit their damage to the annual insurance premium. And that ensures that their damage is not too high. And that from a macroeconomic point of view is desirable because it will promote the rollout of AI because the liability risk aren't too high. And on top of that, the redress chain makes sure that the buck stops where it should stop, i.e. the party which really was at the cause of the damage ultimately. And the involvement of the insurance company makes sure, as I said first, that the, the damage is limited to the annual insurance premium, but makes also sure, because it, it's not the insurance company of a software developer which pays, because they will transfer this to um, the community of the, all the insured. And that means that the damage at the end is covered by the community of all insured. And that from a macroeconomic point of view is also something desirable, because it will lead to promoting the rollout of the AI technology. Okay, so that is the role of redress and insurance, which I wanted to explain. And now I'm, I see that already fairly um, late in my uh, allocated time. So just for concluding, basically, what are the next steps? Uh, the Commission has already launched a few months ago an inception impact assessment, where we asked, we gave a feedback period. Um, and we have received some feedback. 
Uh, the next thing will be next month, we will um, launch a, a dedicated uh, public consultation focusing on AI liability. So harmonization of national AI systems, fault-based, strict-based liability, and the product liability directly. And we will ask a number of questions among others also, <coughs> I apologize about the role of insurance and whether it should be voluntary or mandatory, etc. Uh, so basically uh, that will run for three months and we're very much looking forward to your participation. And at the end, the commission has announced for 2022, a legislative initiative, what it will be and that I, I don't know yet. And I simply, it's not that I, can't, I don't wanna say, I can't say because it's not yet politically decided. We will, we are doing, working at the moment on an impact assessment, doing a number of studies. Uh, and basically um, we are launching this public consultation and the, the result of this will be also very important input into the political decision to be taken. Whether there will be a legislative proposal and what kind of shape and form it will have. But as I said, I'm looking very much forward to your input into this public consultation and to interesting discussions to come. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Our next speaker will be Mark Geisfeld. Uh, let me, um, uh, again, not do his resume justice, but Mark is a longtime professor at New York University Law School and a uh, well-known in the U.S. for both his torts and his law and economics scholarship. We'll be addressing um, uh, AI in the more specific context, building on Dirk's remarks about uh, autonomous vehicles. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to, for reasons uh, alluded to by Dirk, I'm going to start by discussing autonomous vehicles, <clears throat> the liability and associated insurance implications. Um, and then I'll generalize to artificial intelligence more generally. Um, now, of course, in the U.S., we've got 50 tort system, 50 states, uh, each with their own uh, tort and insurance systems. And federal government doesn't play a very active role here. So the kind of legislative intervention that you're seeing in Europe, um, I'll, I'll talk about what's happening legislatively in the US, um, but there's nothing that's likely to approach what you're gonna have in Europe. Um, so I'll work with the existing framework and uh, then and, and apply that to autonomous vehicles. Um, so Oliver, if you could put the first, uh, I'm going to show it's a little complicated how liability and insurance works right now in the US. Um, and so I just want to uh, describe our current regime, which, you know, we, whereas in, in Europe, for example, strict liability of the owner, um, there's nothing like that. Uh, in the US. As, as I'm sure um, you know, we're very much a fault-based system. Um, so it looks like all the formatting is showing up there. Um, but uh, in the end, so the current regime is, is um, largely based on negligence. And of course, most crashes involving motor vehicles these days are caused by the negligence of either uh, one, either one or both of the drivers, um, and in fact, negligence suits uh, in automobile crashes uh, comprise the largest number of tort suits in state courts, um, just dominates the docket. Um, so, in the event that uh, either one of the drivers is negligent and causes a crash. Now, the thing about recovery of damages in tort is you get both economic and not non-economic damages. Uh, non-economic damages of pain and suffering are quite considerable in the U.S. Um, and so that those damages, the liability for both economic and non-economic damages, are covered uh, in the first instance by mandatory third-party uh, insurance covering the negligent driver. Um, the owner has to purchase that. Uh, that coverage is going to apply to the negligent driver. Now, if you own a vehicle, you can also, that, now the, the mandatory limits are, are pretty low, um, $25,000 $25, individual, $50,000 a crash, maybe going up to $100,000 for private vehicles, but it's pretty low. Um, and so there's also coverage available if you own a vehicle, you can buy coverage called underinsured motorist coverage, UIM, uh, there. So that in the event that the other driver's negligence only covers $50,000 of 
of the uh, damages, uh, but your damages are much higher, then in effect, you can buy liability insurance that'll go on top of the negligent drivers. But notice again how this is all piggybacked on the, the negligence of one or the other of the driver. Now, if we focus on the negligent driver uh, himself there, there you're only going to get medical payments under the owner's auto policy because you're a user of the, you're an occupant of the vehicle. If you're in a no-fault state, you'll, you'll, you'll have access to more insurance covering other kinds of economic losses like lost wages, depending on the state in question. You will not, however, get any damages for pain and suffering, uh, which can be considerable. Um, and so the negligent driver, as contrasted with every other victim of the crash, is going to get the lowest compensation. And the idea there, of course, is that creates an incentive uh, to avoid negligent driving in the first instance. Uh, the owner of the vehicle driven by the negligent driver has to purchase uh, collision insurance uh, in order to cover damage to the vehicle. Now, uh, any damages beyond those covered by automobile insurance, uh, in principle, you could recover against the negligent driver. Uh, in practice, though, it's extraordinarily difficult to get to the assets of an individual. And so in practice, uh, the amount of auto insurance proceeds basically determines the amount of money you get in the tort suits. Um, if you're going after a business with assets, of course, that's different. Um, but what that means basically are excess damages beyond the policy limits uh, that, that are discussed above are going to be borne by the victim and in turn their first party health insurers, disability insurers, or whatever kind of loss we're talking about. But that's, of course, only going to be economic loss. It's not going to be non-economic pain and suffering, which is not covered by insurance. Now, if the crash instead is caused by a defect in either one of the vehicles, um, uh, could be both, of course, but we only need a defect in one vehicle that causes the crash, then the manufacturer of that vehicle and all commercial sellers of that vehicle are subject to strict liability for the injuries. And there the compensation is gonna, again, tort compensation for both economic and non-economic injuries. So it's gonna be covered by the liability insurance purchased by the manufacturer and any other commercial seller of the product. Now, excess here typically is not a problem because you got multiple defendants. One of the reasons for being able to sue commercial sellers is to give uh, victims access to a wider source of compensation and indemnity. Um, and then even if the insurance policies aren't sufficient, you're going after manufacturers, you've got corporate assets, much easier to collect on the judgment. Um, so excess uh, damage is not covered by insurance is really not a problem if we're talking about uh, claims uh, involving defective vehicles that crash. All right, so all the remaining crashes are going to be either not caused by the negligence of either driver or by a defect in either one of the vehicles. Um, and so here, this is, this is where uh, the difference between so-called no-fault states and the rest of the states matter. Everybody, the standard insurance policy is going to cover occupants of the vehicle for medical payments. If you're in a no-fault state, um, they'll give you coverage beyond that, again, for things like lost wages and so on, defined by the statute. But it's only going to be economic damages. Pain and suffering damages, once again, will not be covered in this scenario. In the no-fault world, there's no tort liability and therefore no compensation for pain and suffering. Uh, damage to the vehicle, once again, is going to be covered by the uh, collision insurance that the owner of the vehicle has to voluntarily purchase. So you can see from this setup here that it's, it's, really, uh, it's really built around negligence. Most crashes are caused by human negligence. Uh, we've got a layer of, of strict products liability to ensure that motor vehicles are sufficiently safe. Um, and the system is set up to deal with that particular type of crash. All right, so as we move to autonomous vehicles, so Oliver, you can switch us to the next page. Um, as we move to autonomous vehicles, we eliminate the human driver. And so obviously that's going to shift the liability dynamic considerably. And the question then is how does that uh, interplay with the, the uh, amount of compensation paid by the different types of insurers? All right, now again, since you're just working with 50 different states uh, and so on, um, it's very unlikely at this point in time that you're going to see uh, 
fundamental changes in the governing tort rules across the country. The only way you would, could have that done uniformly would be by federal legislation changing the liability rules governing motor vehicle crashes. And that, as for reasons of federalism, for the national government to uh, step in and do something that has traditionally been handled by the states is extraordinarily unlikely. Um, the federal legislation that's been uh, proposed, it has not yet been enacted. It almost got through during the Trump administration. The House unanimously passed a bill, just to show you how much support there is for this kind of legislation. And it was sailing through the Senate uh, until Uber had that fatal crash in Arizona, um, at which point everything stopped um, out of concern that maybe rushing through this a little bit too quickly and not guaranteeing uh, adequate compensation for victims. In my view, particularly during the experimental period, that's a real concern. Um, and then the election came and the new administration has come in, so there hasn't been much progress. Um, but it's pretty clear from the activity that's gone on thus far that when once the federal statute is enacted, it's going to retain the basic structure that we have for conventional motor vehicles. And so what that means is the federal regulators are going to uh, be able to promulgate uh, motor vehicle safety standards that establish minimum performance standards. How a manufacturer complies with those standards is up to it. So you allow for technological change along all dimensions as long as the vehicle performs in the minimally mandated standard. So I'm assuming that is the kind of federal legislation that we'll get. I'm assuming that there's not going to be any fundamental change in the governing tort rules. So in that world, if we have a crash involving one or more fully autonomous vehicles, what happens? Well, of course, it's possible the other vehicle is driven by a human driver who is negligent. And so that's just going to take us back to the world of negligence that exists right now. Um, so there's not going to be any change in the liabilities or who incurs what costs for those types of crashes. All the action, of course, is in the world of strict products liability, because now the vehicle is being operated by the operating system, the software for which the manufacturer is responsible. It's a component of the product. If the, and so any defect in the software or the hardware will subject the manufacturer to strict products liability. Now it's possible, of course, that a defect in the other vehicle, which is a conventional motor vehicle, caused the crash. So once again, everything is the same as we have right now. Now it's possible if we move to the crash caused by the autonomous vehicle, that there's a malfunction of either the software or the hardware. Now the hardware is not any different from the hardware that malfunctions on motor vehicles today. Um, the steering wheel locks up and the vehicle crashes. So there's no new issues there, no considerable new source of liability that we're, that we're introducing with autonomous vehicles. It all occurs, of course, in the dimension of the software, the operating system that executes the dynamic driving task. Um, now, software that malfunctions, it could be just like we all experience with our personal computers, every once in a while the software freezes. And of course, if it malfunctions like that, if the software freezes and the vehicle crashes, that's a pretty easy case of liability. It's presumably gonna be very rare. Um, so that's really not a significant source of concern. Um, the only substantial source of liability that could be extensive and create massive uncertainty involves third-party hacking. All right, an operating system by definition is supposed to be controlled by the software system itself. Uh, third-party hackings uh, satisfy the definition of a malfunction under US tort law any way you look at it. And of course, third-party hacking caused by terrorists could lead to widespread injury and death and damage. Um, so you could have extensive liabilities that occur on a very uncertain basis. Uh, there's, there's complicated issues about whether there's immunity from liability in these circumstances and so on. So I can't get it deeply into this particular issue, but it's a considerable source of uncertainty. That uncertainty also makes this type of loss, type of liability or type of loss very difficult to ensure. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to flag that. Um, so the more interesting question is, is what happens when you've got a fully functioning autonomous vehicle? So it is working according to its operating system, no defects in the hardware, and ends up being in a crash. I'm assuming, again, that there's federal legislation, and so the vehicle has to comply with federal safety standards. 
All right, now under the existing framework, which is quite likely again to be true under the new framework once it's enacted, is that there is the potential for the federal regulation to preempt state tort law. So that if compliance with the federal regulation is either sufficient to satisfy the tort claim, or if tort liability would otherwise frustrate the regulatory objective, then the federal compliance with the federal regulation will preempt any tort claims. All right, so this is actually going to the whole issue of the design of the operating system. Um, because the key thing I think about understanding the liability implications of autonomous vehicles when they're fully functioning, again, not the kind of crashes that we're talking about above, is that you evaluate the safety performance on a system-wide basis. The same vehicle is driven by the same operating system. So if you've got 100,000 Teslas out on the road right now, it's as if there's one driver of 100,000 vehicles. And so to evaluate the safety performance of that driver, you have to look at the safety performance of those 100,000 vehicles over the intended operating domain of the operating system. And so you're not going to properly evaluate liability on a case-by-case -case basis, because it will certainly be true, as we've seen already, that autonomous vehicles will crash in situations that would be readily avoided by human drivers. But if you just exclusively focus on safety performance in that dimension, what you're going to miss, as Dirk alluded to earlier, is of course most crashes are caused by speeding and drunk driving, people texting, not attentive, and so on. And autonomous vehicles are not going to be involved in those kind of crashes. So the fact that an autonomous vehicle fails in a certain circumstance where a human would succeed doesn't imply that the autonomous vehicle is not reasonably safe, because across the entire domain, it if it works according to plan, it should make the world a safer place. And so the federal motor vehicle safety standard is going to account for this. And so in my view, if the, if the motor vehicle standards, and again, this requires further argumentation than I can give here, if the motor vehicle safety standard required the autonomous vehicle to operate at least twice as safely as a conventional motor vehicle, that a an autonomous vehicle of that type would be immune from tort liability under the rules adopted by the vast majority of states. In other words, compliance with the federal regulation would preempt any tort suits. But of course, we don't know what kind of regulation is going to be enacted, so it's difficult to, to predict what's going to go on. So I have to just assume two possibilities. One is that there's no preemption. Uh, the, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard sets a minimal floor that's much too low and a more demanding tort standard could require that the operating system perform more safely. In order for the operating system to attain that performance, the manufacturer would have to subject it to more extensive pre-market testing so that the autonomous vehicle, more precisely the operating system, has greater opportunity for machine learning to improve performance of the vehicle across the intended domain. Um, the failure to satisfy the requisite amount of pre-market testing means the design of the operating system is defective and subject to strict tort liability. Very uncertain source of liability. Uh, you first, you have to fight about the preemption question. Then it's, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have contentious arguments about how much testing is enough. What are the appropriate testing conditions? Should it be in urban areas? Should it be when it's raining, snowing, and so on? Very difficult questions to answer in a litigation context. So it's both highly uncertain and very costly to litigate these cases. Uh, so if we're in a world of no preemption, uh, this is a bad world for the auto automotive industry to be in. Uh, it's highly uncertain. It's going to be difficult for insurers, and it's going to impede the deployment of autonomous vehicles in the U.S. The other world is one in which the federal regulators come up with a motor vehicle safety standard that's sufficiently demanding so that it satisfies the tort obligation in most states. And again, as I alluded to earlier, I think a standard of that sort would say the autonomous vehicle has got to be at least twice as safe. All right, now if we're in that world, there's a very interesting insurance outcome that happens. Now we're talking, most crashes, if you think about it, are gonna be caused by fully functioning vehicles. We're gonna rarely have defects in the hardware. We're gonna have rarely have defects that cause the software to freeze. Instead, the most common crashes are gonna involve autonomous vehicles that are just are not perfectly safe. 
But if they comply with the federal regulation, they're not going to be defective. And if they're not defective, then the liability is in that no-fault world that we're talking about up above. So that the owner of the vehicle, the injury suffered by the occupants of the vehicle is going to be covered by the owner's insurance. If you're not in a no-fault state, that limits you to medical payments. If you're in a no-fault state, it's going to give you greater coverage for, again, forms of economic loss. Uh, but as we shift to autonomous vehicles, and if we have this kind of preemption world, what's really going to happen is coverage for pain and suffering, which we get now in the tort system and negligence suits, that's going to be eliminated. Those injuries are going to be borne by accident victims. Uh, but then within the space of economic losses, uh, health insurance, lost wages and so on, damage to the vehicle, that's gonna be largely covered by the owner's vehicle, not by manufacturer liability. But that again, all assumes that the federal motor vehicle safety standards are sufficiently demanding. And for a world of no preemption, it's a world of tort law, in which case lots of these liabilities are gonna be covered by the manufacturer's liability insurance rather than the owner's insurance. Um, so the, so the nature of federal regulation in the U.S. is going to largely determine the allocation of costs in, uh, across different forms of insurance. Now, once we generalize beyond autonomous vehicles, the key thing here is when you, the same idea that the safety performance of autonomous vehicles is properly evaluated on a system-wide basis. Uh, the same is true for artificial intelligence in general. These are systems. Uh, they're systems that are trained across wide data sets involving lots of different instances. So you can think about medical devices, things like that. Um, so they will make mistakes in individual cases unless they're perfect, which is possible, but unlikely. Um, but to evaluate the performance on a case-by-case -case basis, misses the fundamental fact that these are systems and you have to operate them on their system-wide performance and not on a case-by-case -case basis. In the U.S., medical devices, that is subject to preemption under federal law. The Food and Drug Administration uh, has uh, exercises regulatory authority over medical devices. They've been more aggressive on re re regulating artificial intelligence than any other regulatory body in the U.S. And the, the, uh, if you comply with FDA regulations, in other words, you show that your device satisfies the kind of performance standards I'm talking about here, then you, the manufacturer, are not subject to liability, which means then again, the injury costs in that world are going to fall on the injury victims themselves. Now here, we don't have you know, auto insurance or anything covering those costs. So the victims of the artificial intelligence that fails to sex successfully execute the operation or whatever, they're going to be the ones that pay. Um, so the insurance system is going to be one that keeps it on the laps of victims. That's going to run into the kind of difficulties that Dirk was talking about, uh, whether this is going to, uh, from a behavioral matter, whether that's going to cause victims or potential victims to distrust the technology and make it more difficult to implement. Those are all fair questions uh, that uh, certainly the existing setup in the U.S. poses. Um, I'll just also say that what's not clear from the example I've given here with autonomous vehicles is that if you have a vehicle that does not comply with federal safety standards and is defectively designed because it does not perform adequately safely across the entire system-wide domain, even though the plaintiff can prove a design defect in those cases, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to prove causation, to prove that the defect is the cause of the injury in question. Um, because even a car that is defect free is going to be in crashes. So you run head on into a very difficult causation problem that is that's that uh, plagues tort law in the US in particular, but I think tort law in general, where you have an increase in the risk, but the risk isn't doubled. Um, and so therefore, you can't show more likely than not that the injury was caused by fault, defect, or whatever. More likely than not, the injury was caused by the background risk. And as a consequence, the plaintiff cannot recover for failure to prove factual causation. That problem plagues this area as well, which again, I think just points towards a robust rule for federal regulation. Um, you've got it going on in Europe, in the US, you know, where again, I think the regulatory regime will end up at least 
uh, operating and the and the both the medical devices and autonomous vehicle realm. Beyond that, it's very difficult to say. Um, and so I guess it's probably best just to end end with that. Thank you for listening. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Mark, for your uh, inspiring intervention and for the insights into the uh, US liability systems and uh, the problems uh, autonomous vehicle may create over there. Uh, thanks again. Uh, so now we turn to uh, Diana Cirini, um, who is uh, going to uh, comment on uh, liability uh, insurance, or liability for artificial intelligence and insurance from a European point of view. I'll just very briefly introduce Diana. She's uh, one of the most prominent insurance lawyers in the European Union, and she's a professor of comparative private law at the law faculty of the uh, Università degli Studi di Milano, and I hope I've pronounced that more or less correctly. Diana, I yield the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for the invitation to speak today and uh, for the not easy task to talk uh, after the uh, speeches of uh, so brilliant uh, a speaker. Um, in the a few minutes that I have, uh, um, I will uh, limit my uh, remarks to some specific points uh, that was raised uh, by um, Professor Stalin Meyer and by Mark, Professor Mark Schaisler. Uh, so the first point uh, is that uh, I'm glad that uh, Dirk Staudenmeyer reminded us of the future uh, discussion on insurance uh, because uh, uh, it is my view to tell the truth that until now the insurance side uh, has not uh, been at the center of the discussion of the uh, European institution and also of uh, some of the reports and comments that I uh, had the chance to read. Uh, I, I don't want to be uh, too harsh on that, but uh, let's just remember that uh, uh, we are creating a single market from in, for insurance uh, since uh, some decades, uh, and uh, uh, the single market for insurance was exactly what allowed uh, uh, the realization of the freedoms recognized by the European Treaty. And so if we look at the perspective that uh, the European institution wants to give uh, to AI and IoT and uh, uh, new technologies, that is to say to increase trust in uh, the citizenships, in uh, the um, population, I think that uh, um, the attention that uh, should be given to insurance is exactly what we need in order to strengthen this trust in new technologies, both looking at the side of prevention of uh, damages, uh, so managing of the risk and prevention of damages, and in case of need of redress where accident occur. The second point uh, that I just want to uh, raise uh, for eventual future discussion is that uh, uh, it was recalled quite well by the speakers, uh, we will have interaction between different model of liability rules and liability regimes. And uh, I just want to uh, stress the fact that this will have uh, a strong impact uh, on the functioning of insurance contract, because uh, it will impact, first of all, on setting of premiums, uh, and it is the, one of the main aspects uh, for uh, the spread and uh, the use of insurance contract, and also on distribution uh, strategies. Uh, let me just remember, uh, as we do not have so much time, that uh, uh, the main system of uh, compulsory insurance, for example, uh, and we have already mentioned that motor liability insurance uh, is uh, mainly a consumer contract uh, or a mass contract, as we are more willing to say in the insurance field. While uh, uh, the combination of uh, uh, liabilities uh, of different types uh, and uh, the uh, presence of different operators, so producers, for example, on one side, uh, those managed algorithms, uh, uh, satellite liabilities, uh, space liabilities, which are 
quite often connected also to new technologies and AI. Uh, well, this uh, will also uh, require a shifting in the paradigm of uh, distribution of insurance, which uh, will become much more uh, a large risk model in many cases than a mask risk uh, uh, insurance contract. Um, then um, I will uh, um, just go back to the alternative uh, that has been raised uh, between uh, facultative or voluntary insurance schemes uh, and uh, compulsory insurance schemes. Well, uh, um, I understand quite well uh, the uh, difficulty in uh, trying to introduce new schemes of compulsory insurance. Uh, and uh, um, this uh, uh, attitude was, of course, at the core of the adoption of the Product Liability Directive back in 1985, uh, when it was first uh, adopted. Anyway, the situation at that time was very different from today. Today we have a single market of insurance and uh, we reached uh, a certain harmonization in uh, the rules of uh, uh, insurance for companies and for intermediaries. Um, so uh, if we look at the actual situation, uh, the uh, presence of uh, a choice, an option. Uh, so the floor for, uh, for example, uh, a voluntary scheme of uh, uh, liability insurance could lead to uh, very significant uh, differences in the European countries, in my view. And this is for two reasons. The first one is that we know that different countries, uh, especially in Europe, have uh, a um, very different approach to uh, the penetration of insurance, the spread of insurance, uh, and this is also highly influenced by cultural reasons. And the second uh, point is that the introduction of compulsory insurance schemes, uh, and I think about motor liability insurance, has been often the case uh, and the chance to also introduce uh, a sort of harmonization of the conditions and terms of the insurance contract in order to create uh, uh, more equality between the victims in one country, but also between among the different countries of the European Union. Uh, for example, if we look at the model of model liability insurance, which each it's a global model in my view, because we have reached uh, quite a high level of harmonization for motor liability insurance in Europe, not only thanks to the directive, but also thanks to the application and interpretation by the European Court of Justice in terms of protection of the victims in setting the, the, the uh, notion of uh, uh, free circulation or other aspects, well, um, introduces a system of compulsory insurance contributes to create uh, more equality, non-discrimination between the victims. So my fear is that uh, a large floor for voluntary insurance could uh, in some way um, um, forbid or anyway uh, not reach the result of creating or maintaining this single market that we have reached so far. Uh, just another very uh, specific point, uh, we are uh, talking about uh, AI, Internet of Things and new technologies, especially AI applied in many fields. Uh, we have mentioned medical liability connected also to MDRs. Uh, we have mentioned uh, motor liability and other aspects uh, and fields of product liability in general. Uh, let's just remember that uh, this new uh, risks uh, or these new uh, um, types of uh, uh, risks connected to uh, new technologies and AI in particular uh, will all, all, uh, often be qualified as catastrophic risk because of their possible magnitude and uh, for of the quantum of damages. And so I think uh, a direct involvement uh, of uh, insurers as well as reinsurers uh, is essentially in order to set uh, the good uh, um, models uh, of uh, uh, liability regimes uh, in this field. 
Um, and this also uh, take me to uh, my uh, two last points. The first one is that uh, we are talking about risks uh, that at the moment uh, have low predictability and lack of historical and actuarial uh, series. Uh, so it will be very important for insurance company uh, managing the risks uh, to have access to data and to facilitate also the exchange of data in order to better manage the risks also in the perspective that we are talking about catastrophic risk. So this is a point that has to be taken into consideration at the European level, because as we know, we have quite strict uh, rules and regulation concerning uh, not only competition law, but also access to data or exchange of information. And uh, um, uh, a last remark is that uh, um, I, I read and I could also discuss with colleagues, experts, uh, uh, members of expert groups, that uh, we sometimes raise the, the point uh, of the alternative uh, uh, also between first party insurance and third party insurance. Uh, for example, the report of the expert group of 2020 uh, seems to suggest uh, an alternative or at least a combination between uh, first party and third party insurance. I am not, of course, uh, undermining this proposal, uh, which was the result of uh, uh, studies and a uh, specific uh, um, researches, but I just want to um, raise a point. Uh, we have very different uh, approaches to insurance in the different member states, as I already said, and uh, uh, the solution of first party insurance uh, has proven to be not really satisfactory, at least in some countries. And so this aspect goes directly in connection with the alternative that I have already mentioned between the choice uh, among compulsory or voluntary insurance. And just to close, uh, let me just remember that uh, the role of insurers in this uh, um, discussion uh, um, and in the future Europe that we are going to build, uh, both with reference to the use of AI and new technologies, but also with reference to the Green Deal, well, the role of insurers uh, uh, and the operators of the insurance market uh, uh, is quite essential because insurers are not only the risk takers and the risk managers uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, managing of the risks, uh, but uh, they are also one, uh, if not the most important financial investors in the market, as it is clearly recognized in the uh, Green Deal and uh, all the regulation uh, connected uh, with reference to uh, sustainable finance and the role of financial investors. So I think that uh, um, the position of insurance uh, should be also considered in this double role, both as risk takers from one side, but also as uh, uh, companies that invest uh, in the market uh, and uh, uh, should be a partner uh, in the um, governing uh, or in the um, activities of companies uh, for the future Europe uh, to be. So this was just some uh, comments that uh, uh, came to my mind while listening to the very uh, interesting and uh, brilliant uh, comments by my uh, colleague before. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, that you, you made us all think a lot about how these things will work, uh, uh, both now and in the very near future. Uh, we appreciate it. I, I have the pleasure now of introducing John Pruitt, uh, who's also going to provide some commentary next. Uh, John is the practice group leader for the insurance group at Evershed Sutherland in New York, uh, in the United States. Uh, he's a highly sought after lawyer uh, for advice on insurance regulation. Uh, and I might also uh, mention that he's a special advisor to the uh, regulatory issues and principles of insurance, international reinsurance law or prickle as some of us might know. Uh, so I invite John to please uh, uh, provide us with some comments as well. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to offer my remarks and uh, uh, and an honor to offer my observations after um, um, hearing some thoughtful presentations. Um, I, I bring a different perspective as a as a pure practitioner. Um, you know, much of what we do involves trying to discern um, what the power dynamics and economic interests are in a given situation, um, and um, and it and it's it's not always that we to step back and think about how th the, the, the underlying principles and how things should be as opposed to uh, how how we should react to how we perceive them to be. Um, I, I, I've made a few observations and uh, uh, kind of along the lines of things that I think would be drivers of, of how the allocation of liability and, and uh, evolves and how insurance plays a role. Um, and, and actually I discovered after I put them on paper, there's a, a common thing uh, among them. And it, it's, it's really the theme is these are things that exist now and are not going the way anytime soon. Um, and um, the, the first of those uh, uh, is, is, is drivers. Um, and, and we just need to be mindful always of the distinction between um, ADAS, automated driver assistance systems, um, which all vehicles now have it, it's some to some degree, um, and fully autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, I think we all know over time there's going to be in, increasing uh, levels of automation uh, with driver assistance to our vehicles um, that. Um, in full form would evolve into fully autonomous vehicles. Um, but um, it will be a long time before that happens. Um, but in the meantime, um, we will have cars that take over or have the ability to take over much of what uh, the, the operator of the vehicle does and is accustomed to doing. Um, and until the time that we have fully autonomous vehicles, we're gonna have a mix of man and machine. Um, and you can have a situation where there's a collision and people are injured and property is damaged and the machine may be blameless, um, but the manufacturer could still be held liable because it didn't properly account for the fact that there is human involvement and there's the risk of human error. Um, this would be where there's alleged to be uh, or that the, the aut autonomous aspects of the vehicle allowed overconfidence um, in its capabilities by the driver and the manufacturer should have accounted for that more than it did. Um, Tesla, in fact, is facing suits that make precisely those allegations um, in, the, in the US right now. Um, you also have the fact that um, you may have one you may, you may have fully autonomous vehicles on the road, but you will still have those that are not fully autonomous um, for some time, probably during the rest of all of our lifetimes. Um, and again, the, 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 what, what the uh, owner, operator, and manufacturer of the autonomous vehicle faces is that the, uh, the programming did not properly account for um, the human error um, and, other, and other drivers. A second item I, uh, it seems to me is, is not going away anytime soon, um, and Diana touched on this, is compulsory insurance. Um, compulsory insurance exists for a reason. Um, in the U.S., um, as, as Professor Geisfeld pointed out, we have a fault-based system, and, and the financial responsibility laws, um, which require the owner of every registered vehicle to have liability insurance, um, those laws exist. Uh, to assure that funds are available uh, to compensate um, uh, the victims of crashes involving at-fault drivers. Um, the, the amounts um, are low, as the professor pointed out, but they are amounts and those, and again, those requirements exist for a reason. Um, and they vary in, in this country, uh, again, I, I'm just amplifying what the professor already pointed out in, in, the, in this country, um, uh, registration of autos is at the, at the state level, um, uh, tort law is, is state-based, um, and insurance regulation is at, this, at the state level, and, and products uh, uh, and, and requirements for insurance vary according to state. Um, and um, that, I, I just, I, I don't see a system where that, that that ever goes away because um, 
the basically legislatures are going to want to make sure that there are funds available uh, for compensation of innocent uh, victims. Um, and even, even in systems in the U.S., this is a footnote, that have no fault systems like New York, there's still um, recourse through the tort system for people, either whether it's for, 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 for uh, economic damages or against defendants that are not protected by the no liability provisions or the no fault laws. So um, financial responsibilities will, laws will continue to exist. Um, uh, this may be a very US centric, the next item, um, but uh, plaintiffs in pursuit of deep pocket defendants, they aren't going away anytime soon. It was a nice fact to hear. I didn't know uh, until Professor Griffin said it, that the number of cases in the court system from uh, involving uh, auto incidents is, is outnumbers all other kinds of uh, cases. Um, I'm not surprised by that, but I didn't know that for a fact. Um, and uh, it just is a fact that injured individuals are going to pursue claims um, wherever they think there's a recovery, whether it's going to be under the owner or operator's own insurance, the uh, insurance of the other driver, uh, the other drivers who are at fault out, uh, beyond what their ins limits their insurance uh, uh, provides, or, or, or the manufacturers of 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 the, of the vehicles, and um, you know, and in, in, in a footnote here, um, if if you get to a system where it's more the vehicles I mean, that are at fault because of automation than the or, 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 the, or the cause, if, whether there's fault or not, the cause, uh, pro approximate cause of the accident, um, rather than driver error, you may find that the biggest claimants um, per pursuing the manufacturers may be insurers who themselves have paid losses and are, are acting as a subrogate of, the, um, of whomever's claim they've, they've, they've paid. Uh, next item, something that's not going away anytime soon, the profit motive of insurers. Um, insurers are going to be willing to write insurance only if they can make an underwriting profit. Um, and in order to do this, I, I believe that Diana touched on this, um, they must be able to reliably, reliably predict uh, future loss costs. Um, and they can only do this if they have adequate historical loss data. Um, and, and, and importantly, they must be able to spread risks across a, a homogeneous risk pool. Um, they can do it very well and are doing it very well in personal auto because of the many tens of millions of, of drivers that produce a massive amount of data that insurers use to price risks. Um, as there are incremental improvements in safety due to ever increasing um, automation in the cars, I don't I, that, that that will not dis, dis, displace this concept of, of of auto insurers being able to uh, write uh, risk uh, 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 and price them predictably. But what you would expect to see is pricing improvement, not displacement of insurance. Um, fully autonomous vehicles is is a different story. If if there's no driver involvement in a collision or a third party who can be held to account, um, that leaves the manufacturer to, to look to. And, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very interested to hear Professor Geisfield's um, uh, views about how he, he views that could go one direction or the other, depending upon uh, how a federal um, U.S. federal legislation evolves, but I'm, I'm still very st skeptical that you, we will have a system in which a broad uh, a, a swath of the of uh, 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 people who are injured uh, by by accidents involving purely automated vehicles um, would not be compensated. And and and, and this goes um, back to Professor Student Meyer's uh, uh, initial comment that um, if you don't ha have a system that ensures compensation, it will it will um, uh, result in mis mistrust of the vehicles and the legal systems. And I think the way that that, that plays out is that uh, deep pockets are, are, are found. Um, and, um, but, but to the extent that it's the manufacturer who is left standing to be responsible, I'm not sure insurance is going to be a solution there. Um, and um, I just, as a side note, I'll point out that the Federal Insurance Office uh, report on cyber for 2020 uh, in, in commenting on the state of the U.S. cyber insurance market notes that policy limits for cyber are relatively low, which is based, also based, which has been my experience in working with clients. Um, the, uh, when they're covering 
uh, rel they're relatively low compared to uh, limits available for traditional property casualty hazards. Um, and the reasons they cite is uncertainty about the aggregation of, of limits to a cyber incident, um, the limits and the capability of, uh, of for uh, capabilities for modeling for cyber events, and then they point out lack of market demand. Um, sort of translating that here for manufacturer uh, insurance for manufacturers for products. Um, I think all those would be would be present, um, but you would also add the inadequate risk pooling. There's so few uh, auto manufacturers that you really wouldn't be able, insurers really wouldn't be able to spread it across a, a deep pool of risks. And in terms of lack of market demand, the demand wouldn't be there um, if the or by manufacturers if the pricing is not efficient. If if due to the uncertainty and the lack of risk pooling, the insurers have to charge just too much money, the the um, manufacturers would self and would would self insure. Um, my last observation um, is um, of things that um, will always be there is the it's the unexpected. Um, there, things will happen that nobody anticipates. Um, I, I, another anecdote: I, I worked with a uh, personal auto insurance company that um, was based in California and, and and was interested in expansion. And I wanted to expand into the Northeast United States. And they looked at Pennsylvania and they looked at a, a whole lot of metrics. They looked at income levels. They looked at population density and other things and decided it was uh, an ideal market for them. And um, it turned out not to be because uh, they, they their 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 model their pricing model was based on their experience in California, where population density and income levels were driving factors. And what they didn't account for is um, much of Pennsylvania that's rural and therefore has a lower po uh, population density. Um, they have a lot of single car co uh, incidents involving. Uh, deer, um, something they didn't have in California. Um, collisions in the deer. If you live in the Northeast, you know you at certain times of year, you have to be very careful about deer in the road. Um, that was just something they had, that was unexpected. Um, just one example, there's going to be things that are going to expect that are going to throw a lot of un uncertainty into it that will, uh, and, and how the liability system will, will evolve and, and how insurers will, 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 will be involved, who, who knows. So. Um, that that's that's my remarks. I think, as I said, I think all of those will be will be drivers, and and I think all, all and each of those remarks kind of amplifies uh, comments that others have made, and I think it, um, uh, you know, in my view, is it, it also uh, is is consistent with Professor uh, Geisfeld's uh, you know views about how the existing tort system uh, will respond. It will respond in a way that adapts to new and different circumstances, but the, within the basic frameworks. And, uh, and thank you, thank you for letting me offer my remarks. Jeff, you're still muted. I was, uh, we have a who's on first. I thought Helmut was gonna moderate the questions uh, at this point, but. Oh, but, uh, okay. <laughs> let, let, let me uh, uh, let's see, we have a number of questions in the queue that people can see uh, from the chat. And, and, and what I've noticed is that there seems to be that several are directed in some way to the UK Act of 2018, which I will uh, profess ignorance about. But I was wondering uh, if, any, if uh, any of our panelists or commentators uh, had a particular thought on that who may be better informed than, than I am. Particularly, I'm interested in this um, concern about whether um, the last question about whether under the law, um, you know, the transparency requirement for an AI system is going to um, mitigate, if not avoid, some of that opaqueness problem that I sort of think Mark was referring to in terms of some of the causation issues, at least that we would have in the United States on, on proving liability and, and whether that, you know, A, that's that's everybody's thinking if it, people know about the statute, but B, is the technology at a level that we can have that kind of trans, 
transparency where the transaction costs of, of uh, you know, you, the causation might be provable in theory, but if the transaction costs are too huge, it will drive away claims. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing if there are other sorts of compensation and all of this should be handled first party. But the scary thing that I heard was the idea of pain and suffering damages not being paid. And as John and Dirk have, have alluded to, if there's a sense of undercompensation, there will probably be resistance to AI. Um, uh, thoughts on that by any of our uh, speakers or commentators? I don't know if uh, other colleagues want to say something first. Don't all speak at once. Uh, I just want to, if uh, I will take only one minute, I'm not going into the details of these questions, but uh, the mention to the uh, UK Act of 2018, um, it, it shows exactly the risks I was mentioning before about uh, uh, the fact that we need uh, at a certain moment an action on insurance at a European level because the act, uh, well UK is actually in a quite peculiar position but uh, uh, the act tried to offer a solution not only to liability rules but also to uh, what could happen to the insurance uh, of the liable party and uh, um, I remember Remember, it mentioned, for example, the fact that uh, the, the insurance contract could not, in some way, reduce the the the, uh, the, the right of the victims or uh, uh, introduce exception to the coverage. So uh, it is an example of what happens uh, if we do not have an action at the European level. The risk of uh, diverging systems uh, uh, and solution proposed by national legislatures uh, in order to solve problems uh, connected to the application of the insurance scheme. Mm, so. Um, as I said, I will not go into the specific solution of, of the Act, but uh, uh, quite significantly it mentions uh, the, uh, the, the, the position of insurance uh, and of insurance uh, and the fact that they cannot oppose exceptions to the, to the coverage. And it was necessary to say that uh, clearly. And the risk is that uh, we do not have a common solution if we not consider the insurance schemes uh, together and always at the side of the liability regimes at the European level. I, I can say a few words too. I mean, basically, um, I have not read the UK Act, but I've read about it. And what I understand is that it does a purely insurance-based solution. And what comes to my mind when I'm reading, this, and does not clarify, but perhaps I'm wrong, uh, liability as such. Uh, if that is the case, then from an insurance point of view, from an insurance business point of view, I would not like that. Because uh, for redress, it's particularly, regress, it's particularly important that you establish liabilities, because then you can as the insurance which compensated the victim in my example you know insurance of the the car owner um, are then able if you know who else may be liable afterwards go against the other party who is really at the cause and if that's not defined then it doesn't help me anything it just helps the victim i mean just helps the victim <laughs> it's obviously important to help the victim but it wouldn't help the insurance business. So that's one comment which I wanted to make. The second comment concerns the AI Act. Uh, obviously the AI Act is an important point really. And, um, <clears throat> but one has to see the um, perspective of it. So the AI Act looks at AI from a safety and ethical angle. And indeed it has a transparency obligations and the human oversight obligation, but the way the AI Act is drafted, at least in the, in the state when it was proposed by the Commission, the intention was not to allow a victim to be able to prove causality and fault. It does by far, it, it does not go far enough, basically, is the problem. It goes far enough that I can judge as a user, do I want to buy AI and how should I use this? But it doesn't allow me then 
to discharge of my burden of proof. So I'm afraid uh, the AIC is something good, but it is, it's two sides of the same coin, so to speak. One is the ex ante um, viewpoint. We, we're trying to prevent accidents happening, but what it does not do is um, discharge the problem if an accident has happened. And that we still, I'm afraid we still need basically, because there is no, safety is a concept. There's no absolute safety and you cannot achieve absolute safety. Also not with transparency obligations. There will always be accidents. There'll be less accidents very clearly, but there will always be accidents. And for that one needs an adapted liability system. Thank Indeed. you. And, and on that note, um, this is maybe a good time since we're almost out of our uh, allotted 90 minutes to note that we have a program, a lecture. Uh, we have the lecture scheduled. We have not fleshed out uh, the entire uh, list of participants. Uh, uh, but for November 11th uh, of this year uh, at uh, uh, 5 uh, p.m. Coordinated Universal Time and, and corresponding times and other time zones. And our topic is going to be the compensation of victims for artificial intelligence and uh, basically looking more deeply than we have today, building on the work that was done today about liability and regulation, about the compensation systems and what the um, you know, changes may or may not be in the insurance and compensation regime, uh, the interaction of the private sector and government, and all of that will be on the table for our November 11th program. Well, we, uh, those of you who are still on board and are on our mailing list will be getting information about that, and we certainly hope you'll be able to uh, join us for that event as well. Uh, Helmut, any concluding remarks? No, just uh, thank you very much to everybody and um, to, all the, to all the participants and uh, most of all, of course, to all the speakers for their wonderful presentations. And I think it will be you doing the farewell as well, Jeff. Huh? <laughs> okay. and, and I can only uh, doubly thank all of our participants for some really thought-provoking presentations. I've got a, a page of crammed notes that will, uh, will keep me occupied for some time uh, intellectually and temporally. And thank you again for our audience for uh, your attention and, and your, um, your insights as well. Appreciate it. So with that, that we'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>